Hey, Dr. Picolas. This is the first video in a short series on a detailed explanation of functional programming for estimation. I know they've been a long time coming, so I'm happy to finally make them, but uh, this is also the first video I've ever made, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, this is just a giant experiment. In these videos, I'll build up a small example with working Python code of uh, a common filter, classical common filter, and a UKF. When we met the last time, I think uh, the, the approach I took made it a little bit difficult to get my, my uh, point across. You know, I, I introduced this new language that you likely, uh, you know, had not seen before, and I was talking about generic category theory. But from here on out, I will start with a motivating example and uh, try to work towards building up this program uh, from, from the get-go. And along the way, I will describe, uh, as, as we get more in depth into uh, making our code generic, I will uh, talk more and more about uh, the abstract concepts behind uh, the choices that we are making. So this should solve some issues, uh, one of them being that uh, since I'm more familiar with Python, then uh, it'll be easy to do this example here uh, in, in that language, but it does come with its own set of disadvantages. So for instance, some concepts I'll be covering are implemented a little bit more elegantly in Haskell because they uh, Haskell was sort of built around these concepts. It was built with uh, them in mind. And uh, so in that case, I will simply talk about the differences between Python and Haskell. I won't go so much into Haskell as I was. Okay, let's get started. Now, I have a list of various estimation algorithms that uh, some, some we went over in class in uh, Dr. Humphrey's, you know, Dr. Humphrey's estimation class. Uh, some, in the case of the Romanian UKF, uh, are outlined in the Menegaz paper. And a point that I want to make is that the derivation of each of these algorithms requires a lot of work. I would like to know is there an algorithm that we could write that could potentially automatically derive any estimator based upon its specifications? The objective here would be to find the commonalities between every single algorithm and uh, sort of uh, discover the essence of estimation as a whole and to distill this essence into its purest form. So what I mean by that is that um, in, in each of these algorithms uh, there is some underlying structure that uh, could be exploited for um, you know with, with functional programming for the purposes of um, making derivations easier easier or even potentially automatic I would like to distill the similarities between each of these algorithms and encode the, the similarity into a single program that could potentially be used to autocode or metaprogram, as I would put it, um, any of these other algorithms. So for instance, in this little drawing, I have a generic Bayesian filter generator. So I would like to generate, or I'd like to write some sort of meta program or meta algorithm that can generate each of these more specific trackers given the circumstances for uh, its its input. So, for instance, it, you know, say we could write a program that um, I can input the specification that my uncertainty is um, you know Gaussian over some um, over some vector space and uh, it's transformed through linear maps then what if this Bayesian filter generator could look at that and say oh that's you know this is a common filter here is the algorithm for that and similarly if um, instead of a linear map it was a C infinity map then it could take that as an input, um, you know, take the specification as an input, rather, and generate the EKF, and so on and so forth. Um, we have a point sample here, which could generate sort of a sequential Monte Carlo filter. A weighted point sample could generate a particle filter, and this is a sigma R, a sigma representation, uh, would generate a UKF. 
a manifold sigma r would take an r uk or generate a, the menegaz Ramanian UKF. And uh, for here, there would be a weighted Gaussian sum that I would put into this generator, and it would generate a Gaussian mixture filter. And in particular, um, now cl clearly, there's we, we, it's impossible to program something in full generality without requiring at least um, some extra information. Uh, from you know any of these guys. So, for instance, if the if the filter generator doesn't know what a Gaussian is or a linear map is, well, um, it would say, or at least in in the programming practice, there there would be an outline for specifying that um, you know oh I, I need to explain how linear maps work. I need to explain how Gaussians work, and so on. But beyond that, it could say. Um, well, you know, Gaussian C-infinity map is actually pretty similar, except for uh, the, the difference in the types of mappings. So what if this generator could, um, you know, say, hey, there's, there's actually commonality between these two algorithms in the form of the, the fact that, um, you know, our uncertainty is represented as a Gaussian normal distribution. So the only difference is that, um, you know, I can... I can use a lot of the common filter framework, but I need the user to specify this, um, you know, how the C-infinity map works, and you know, how to take derivatives, and, and so on and so forth. And similarly, you know, if, if we have um, a sequential Monte Carlo filter um, that is generated from some kind of point sample, uh, and I want to upgrade to a particle filter, well, the only thing I really need to uh, specify is how these weights are handled. And actually, um, you know, the sigma representation is pretty much just a weighted point sample. So, you know, if, if this filter generator could specify or could, could at least uh, discern, um, you know, how these things are related to each other, then it would make the process of um, of programming and deriving um, some, you know, some modification of one algorithm to a to the next. Um, you know, it, it would make that process much easier. You know, for instance, the difference between uh, the manifold sigma r, or rather the you know the Ramanian UKF and the regular UKF, is you know only the um, you know, the only difference really is just the specification of how this geometry works. We should not have to reprogram a UKF just for the Ramanian case. And then actually, what I love about the Gaussian mixture filter is that it seems to be a combination of multiple bits of this. You know, these are the Gaussian, the weighted Gaussian sums have elements of Gaussians in them, but they also have elements of weighted point samples. So, what if this filter generator could, um, you know, combine different aspects of different algorithms to form the Gaussian mixture filter? So why don't we take a look at, um, you know, in, in this case, I do want to look at at least the common filter and the UKF, and um, let's take a look at these two algorithms and see where the commonalities are and, and the differences are between these two. So um, where we left off, we were looking at uh, the unscented common filter and the traditional uh, classical common filter. And I have Dr. Humphreys's notes pulled up here and I have Dr. Jones's notes pulled up here. Now for the classical common filter, we have this propagation step. If we're given a function, um, if we're given a dynamics model, x of k plus 1 is uh, fx plus gu plus v, where v is some Gaussian noise. And then z is, uh, this is the measurement model right here. z is hx plus w, where again, w is some noise. Then we can propagate the, oh, also we are given a prior uncertainty, 
which is probably not listed here, but uh, I think it's in this. I think it's in this table. So the a priori state estimate is going to be uh, x hat, or rather the opposite. The a posteriori state estimate is going to be x hat at time k. The prior state estimate is going to be x bar at uh, k plus 1. And then this uh, p will be our um, posterior uncertainty and our uh, prior uncertainty is p bar. So given an initial prior, or initial sort of, yeah, given an, in given an initial prior uncertainty and estimate, then we can propagate this, uh, you know, to become x bar of k plus 1 is going to be f times x hat of k plus gu. Um, so it's just the s, uh, it's just the mean propagated through the dynamics model and uh, without the noise component and then the uncertainty propagates as fpf transpose plus, plus q. So you can do something similar for, and I'm sure you know this, uh, for the z's, right? So we have the measurement is propagated through h, and the measurement uncertainty will be this guy right here. So I actually want to give, um, I'm, I want to simplify these equations just a bit. So if I have I actually want to simplify uh, these equations just a bit. I, um, you know, I, I don't want to make things time varying. I, I want this to be as simple of, a, of an example as possible. And um, this notation is a little bit busy uh, for my taste personally. So I have the simplified version of the common filter right here. And as you are likely familiar with still, um, if we're given uh, an x naught and uh, our dynamics model is uh, x of k plus 1 is fxk plus vk and measurement model is similar uh, zk is h times xk plus wk then uh, and, and v and w are these uh, Gaussian noises then we can propagate the model like so so this is propagating the state from the um, from the posterior of the former update to the current prior um, and then similarly this is propagating the uncertainty and we can propagate uh, to the measurement uncertainty space here. Now the update step um, we're Actually, w one thing I want to specify is that in, in the example, I'm only going to be focusing on um, this portion of the algorithm. The update has some extra structure that I still really haven't quite figured out yet, but there is plenty to go off of based on you know just this. Now, looking at, I'm going to stop recording. Now let's look at the unscented common filter. So the whole point of the unscented common filter is that if you have a nonlinear propagation uh, or a nonlinear dynamics model such as this, then the common filter linearization, or rather the yeah, so the linearized form of the common filter is the extended common filter, um, and that simply doesn't cut it for um, you know large uncertainty under nonlinear models. Um, now, Monte Carlo simulation can, um, you know, is better, but it can be computationally expensive. So the unscented common filter is sort of this poor man's quote unquote um, uh, Monte Carlo simulator. So you approximate a uh, Gaussian uncertainty with a set of uh, intelligently chosen sigma points. You um, propagate those sigma points, or rather you, you map those sigma points through the dynamics model, and then you recompute their um, uncertainty, or you, you recompute the mean and the covariance uh, of these propagated sigma points. And it, it forms sort of a better approximation of the Gaussian than the linear map, 
um, clearly not as good. Uh, you know, there's still some difference between uh, the propagated sigma points and the Monte Carlo uh, simulation, but uh, it's, it's still pretty close. So in the unscented Kalman filter, you have a an algorithm for generating the sigma points, and then you propagate the sigma points through your nonlinear function here. Uh, and then to recompute uh, the uh, mean and uncertainty, then uh, you simply have a weighted sum of your sigma points, um, you know, times times these weights that are predetermined. And there's there are some equations for determining weights, and it's it's dependent on some tuning parameters. So again, I want to simplify these equations just a bit, just to become you know come to a um, just to represent things in sort of a consistent notation. So uh, we should, for each propagation step, we generate the sigma points by um, taking our prior uncertainty and decomposing it through Cholesky or some other sort of square root type computation. And then we can generate the 2n plus 1 sigma points here. And then each of those sigma points, which is given in a calligraphic x, we map those through our dynamics function. And then our new uh, mean and covariance will be this weighted sum. And here I have things represented instead of instead of saying you know y minus x times y minus x transpose, I, I prefer actually to use this tensor squared notation. Uh, so that's that's just for you know ease of uh, writing or you know um, it, it, it makes the symbols a little bit more compact so one thing to note here is that this dynamics model does not have noise incorporated so there are some extra steps you have to take to propagate noise we will go into that later but in fact today we are only going to consider dynamics and measurement mo measurement models that do not have this VK and WK term. So when we get into noise, that's that's a, a completely other step. Um, and actually, you know, adding this noise term makes the structure of this problem super interesting, uh, which we will get into later. But for now, um, we will simply just be coding up an example where uh, the dynamics model is simply a matrix F and the measurement model is a matrix H. And again, this is a, you know, in, in, in the most general sense, this could be a nonlinear transformation, but um, I will simply make this function uh, the same function uh, here. Um, just, it'll, it'll be some linear transformation F and H will be this same type of propagation through to the me measurement space. And that's just for ease of uh, comparing our two uh, algorithms. All right, so to get at the heart of the problem, what we need to do is, um, or at least if we want to code in a functional style such that, you know, in, in a style that allows us to extrapolate, you know, and, and abstract the commonalities between both algorithms, uh, then uh, one common thing that functional programmers do is that they uh, first write out the type signatures of each of the functions that they are working on, or, or, or each of the functions that they're coding up. So, in the case of each of these algorithms, it's best for us to get uh, get a good sense of the spaces under which we are doing these transformations and to write out the signatures of each of the functions and the mappings and the transformations uh, and the dynamics model and everything and um, so that so that we can sort of and, and sort of lay things out into some flow diagram or you know some category like diagram where um, the the spaces are going to be objects and we we can draw arrows representing functions in between each of these spaces so I did that here 
So what I did first was that I wrote out the type signature for uh, the dynamics and the measurement models. And I also like to write it out as a sort of, uh, I like to write out the functions in a mapping uh, sort of uh, uh, notation as well. And actually there should be a little bar right here because this is a maps to um, arrow. And so in this case I'm going to have the state, state space is going to be Rn and so the dynamics model is, uh, or rather the discrete dynamics model is going to map a state x within Rn to Rn and then the measurement space uh, is simply going to be Rm so H the measurement model will map Rn to Rm and again we do not have any noise incorporated into this model, but we will get there. Now, when it comes to propagating, uh, say we have a prior uncertainty, then the prior uncertainty is not going to live inside Rn. It's actually going to be an element of the set of parameterized n-dimensional Gaussian distributions. So. I wrote this space here on the right, where, um, and I'm, I'm using a calligraphic n for normal distribution, uh, and n to the n is going to be the family of all parameterized n-dimensional Gaussian distributions. Now, um, a Gaussian PDF, um, you know, it, it is parameterized, and specifically, it's parameterized by a mean and a covariance. So we can say that n to the n is actually equivalent uh, to, or can be represented as the set Rn cross Sn plus to use your notation uh, that, that um, you've been using in the optimization lectures. So if we have a prior meaning covariance, like here, then, um, or rather we have a, a, a former time, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if we have a former time step posterior uh, uncertainty, meaning covariance, then we want to map that uncertainty through to our x bar and our, um, so this, this is the, the new prior un, uh, uncertainty, or the new prior mean and the new prior uncertainty, and it's given by this formula here. So, uh, we map the mean simply through the matrix F, and P gets mapped through FPF transpose. So you can consider this actually to be a mapping from the parameterized set of Gaussian distributions, um, you know, from n to the n going over to n to the n again. Now, notice you can do the same thing for the oh and uh, one thing I, one thing I want to, to note is that this is this is a pretty different um, it, it doesn't seem like much of a change but it's it's sort of a philosophically different approach to this problem over the uh, simply imperative um, over the imperative uh, algorithm that we see here so you know before we would simply or at least in the notes given by Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Jones, uh, we are mapping the, okay, and my, my PDF viewer is, oh, it went all the way to the particle filter. So let's see, uh, I think it was on this page. Yeah, so in the notes given here, um, th there's, there's not this sort of, uh, we're not taking a, uh, uh, a step back or sort of an overview type top-down approach to uh, looking at what is you know which algorithms and, and which which uh, models are mapping what to what um, so uh, this is more sort of an imperative approach and uh, he sort of gives a uh, in one of these pages he gives uh, sort of a step-by-step -step algorithm here right so um, 
he says, you know, step step one set k to, or step zero set k to be zero, and then and then propagate state and covariance, um, measurement update of state and covariance, and then compute all these guys. But in our in our functional algorithm, we want to view these things as actual mappings themselves. And we can combine these mappings in different ways to um, have, you know, have, have different effects and, and hopefully solve the problem. But the hope is that if we can write everything out as a generic mapping, then we can do a similar thing for uh, the unscented common filter and for um, you know, every other version of our estimators. Um, and, you know, if, if, we write, if we write things as generic mappings, then we can write a generic uh, Kalman filter, um, or rather a generic Bayesian filter generator that um, only works with sort of the generic um, non-specific mappings. So when, when we're wanting to write this guy, we can, we can write it only in terms of any unspecified mapping, such as the uh, propagator that takes, you know, the prior or rather the the, the previous time step uncertainty to the um, to the current time step uncertainty, and in this case, um, it's it's similar. Uh, if we have uh, the prior uncertainty in state space, then uh, instead of building this, uh, so previously we built this uh, mapping phi, then in this case we are building a mapping eta, which is, uh, wh which takes the state uncertainty to the measurement uncertainty space. So if we have a prior mean and covariance, we map it to the mean expected measurement and the measurement uncertainty. So. This is for the classical common filter. Let's look at the unscented version here. So again, I'm going to represent the set of all sigma representations of, a, uh, of, a, of an uncertain distribution as sigma r to the n. So this is the family of sigma n-dimensional representations of PDFs, where a sigma representation is um, given by essentially a list of uh, weighted, um, it's essentially a list of weighted points in the space under consideration in Rn. So I kind of wrote that out here, and it's a little it's a little much to unpack, but um, I have the sigma r of n, and, and also the sigma r notation is used by uh, Menegas in the, um, in, the, in the Gaussian, or sorry, in the Ramanian UKF, uh, you know, the manifold UKF uh, paper that we were talking about. So uh, he doesn't use specifically sigma r to the n, but he says, you know, a sigma r is some kind of representation of a PDF. And so I'm just simply using this to consider the space of these representations. And so here we have, um, you know, it's equivalent to Rn is um, simply a, a single point, or rather an element of Rn is a single point in our space. And then plus, or, and then it's cross the positive reals squared. So, I, you know, and, and I just kind of wrote this uh, because if we, uh, what we want to do is we want to pair an R, uh, we want to pair an X to uh, a set of two positive weights. One being a weight for the mean and another, another being a weight for the covariance. And I raise this whole thing to the 2n plus 1 uh, because it is a, um, you know, this is a representation, uh, or rather a sigma representation has 2n plus 1 points. So now, for the UKF, we have a slightly different scenario. We don't just have the, uh, the mappings between the 
uncertainties, uh, or rather a mapping between the, the family of uncertainties in the state space and uh, going to the measurement space. But we also have these two transformations that take a Gaussian uncertainty to a sigma representation of that Gaussian. And similarly, we have another, we have another mapping that takes a, um, a sigma representation to its approximation as a Gaussian. So in the case of Dr. Jones's notes, that was represented by this transformation here. So I'm calling this the unsent transformation. And this is the sent transformation. So it's taking, uh, so unsent takes this uh, X bar and this L, where L is simply a decomposition of the P and it forms the sigma points and the weights I think are listed um, oh geez where are they the weights are listed here now uh, and then and then further the scent transformation uh, takes the weights and uh, the sigma points and it computes a an approximation of the mean and covariance so one thing to note here is that the this is not a, these are not bijections they are not inverses from each other, but the sent operation is a left inverse of unsent. So um, unsent goes from the Gaussians to the sigma representations, and it's an injective function or a monic function, and sent is a surjective or an epic. Function. So it, it um, is merely an approximation, and it's the it it's the second order approximation specifically of the sigma representation. But similarly, we have this phi ut and eta ut that uh, map the sigma points from our uh, x minus or k minus one timestamp to our current k timestamp. And then we take uh, the prior sigma representation of the uncertainty and map it to a, um, and, and, and we map that to the measurement uncertainty. And again, this mapping is simply going to be the, uh, it's, go it's the representation of, uh, or it is, it is represented by uh, this algorithm here where you uh, take each weight or take each sigma point and uh, pass it through the nonlinear function or in our case the linear function uh, and then you sort of collect uh, and and you maintain the weights and you collect everything into um, another sigma representation which is just a collection of those transformed sigma points all right so w one last thing before we get coding <laughs> is that I want to say that I just, when it comes to each of these mappings and functions, I, um, I did write sort of a little diagram right here that, um, that just sort of puts these mappings into words. So what we start out with is a simply a dynamics model F and a measurement model G and again it maps uh, F maps a state to a state and uh, I, I'm sorry I said G but I meant H H maps a state to a measurement now when we propagate then we are uh, sort of converting everything to uh, the Gaussians so we have phi which maps a Gaussian uh, to uh, a Gaussian in the state space and then eta maps uh, a Gaussian state to a Gaussian measurement. And this sort of motivates the question um, if I only start with an F and an H then I would like to potentially write a function or an algorithm that could take any dynamics model and transform it into a propagator. 
So I'd like to write a higher order function that takes an f as an input and turns it into a phi. And similarly, I'd like to write a higher order function that takes an h as an input and, and, and returns an eta. Now, as we will see, th this will end up being the same uh, function. And, you know, that's sort of implied by the fact that uh, we get a very similar uh, propagation model here. So, I'm uncertain if you have uh, seen uh, higher order functions before, but, um, you know, these, these are simply, there are some languages, not all languages support this, but some programming languages support higher order functions, which are functions that can take in functions and return functions. So one instance of that is the um, MATLAB and Python both have these features. So if we look up the uh, MATLAB documentation on anonymous functions, then so if we define a square function as a function that takes in an x, so that's what this at notation is, and returns an x squared, then integral is a good example of a higher order function. So it takes in a function itself, square, and some bounds, and it returns a value. And so you can see how some programming languages, especially function, like pure functional programming languages, um, are, uh, you know, sort of take this concept to the extreme. So one example actually would be the compose function, which I could write in Python, but it, it's actually given its own, um, it's, it's given its own notation in Haskell, or, or rather it's a default function. Um, but compose is an excellent example where I could say, you know, compose, and I'm going to write this in in Python. Um, so, uh, you yeah, this would be a def compose, and it'll take an f and a g. And in this case, uh, there are several ways that we could write this, but I'm I'm going to write it. Um, at, you know, by having another def statement inside of our function. So I'd, I'd say uh, def h, which takes an x, and it would return f of g of x. And so compose is going to return this h function. So I'd say return h. So we're going to be doing this a lot. We're going to be defining higher order functions through making a function, making an interior function, and then returning that function as a result of the first function. So this, this is the higher order style. We could have also said, um, def compose f of g and we would simply return instead of doing this we could write return lambda x and f of g of x so this is the lambda notation and uh, of course, in Python, uh, it uses ASCII instead of instead of lambdas. So, um, you know, this this would be ri written out as lambda, uh, the word. Uh, but it's it's returning a function that takes in an x and returns f of g of x. So this compose is returning uh, this function h. So we would like to do something here. We would like to take a pulling out some spare paper from my exam, I think. Um, you know, we, we would like to define a function such as uh, lift, you know, that takes in an f and returns a phi. 
this. So we're going to work, when we, when we program, uh, we are going to work towards defining this lift function. One more thing to note is that for the unscented transform, we also have this uh, sent and unsent mapping. So unsent would take an n to the n uh, over to an r to the n. So unsent is this guy. And sent is this guy. OK, so now let's get to programming. So I have an empty um, you know, Python file here, just functional programming example. And uh, note that I have a master version here. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not just programming this on the fly. It is, I, I do have a reference. Uh, but so the first thing we will do here is um, just import NumPy. And I might make this, um, let's see, a lot bigger. I'm hoping that that's a little bit more visible on the screen. So we are importing NumPy as NP. And uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, build up the set of Gaussian distributions, or parameterized Gaussian distributions. So as we said before, the family of Gaussian distributions is simply parameterized by a pairing of, a, uh, of an n-dimensional vector with an, uh, a positive semi-definite matrix in Rn. And thus, when we want to build a function or a method or you know algorithm that takes in an uncertainty then we need to build up uh, this x or rather we need to specify x comma p as being a data type now in haskell we would simply write this as type Gauss, you know, something like this, um, equals Rn, or we, we would write it as pair Rn, comma, Sn plus. And again, this is sort of a pseudo Haskell here. Uh, we would have to build up this, you know, we would have to either find a library that has representations for these vector data types. You know, in, in Python we have um, NumPy, uh, and so that, that allows you to represent uh, matrices, matrices and, and vectors as uh, n-dimensional arrays, uh, but, uh, and, and there are a couple of libraries that do this for us in Haskell as well, but um, if we don't use those libraries, we would actually need to build up this set ourselves, as, uh, you know, Rn being something like, uh, you know, int cross, int cross, int, or something like this. Um, so luckily we don't have to do that here, and, and we're not going to do that in Python. We're just going to sort of use the higher level um, constructs that are already given to us. So we need to do that so that we can actually specify uh, data as being something like x is equal to, you know, Gauss of, um, you know, 2, 3, comma, you know, 1, 2, 2, 3, or something like this. So. Let's do that here in the code. So instead of specifying a data type like we would in Haskell, um, the only thing we can do here is uh, is build up a class. So um, uh, as I said, Python is sort of an object-oriented programming language. So um, I would uh, simply just need to write uh, class Gaussian. And I, I, uh, I would make the constructor. And this constructor would take in a mean and a covariance. And from here, I'm, I'm simply just going to uh, make a constructor that stores values that you give it. 
so if this code were written a little bit more rigorously, then we would do type checking, make sure that you know mean is a vector and covariance has positive semi-definite or something like that. But here I'm just going to write uh, self.mean equals mean and self.covariance equals covariance. Now I might also make a couple of other attributes. Uh, one useful one being um, dimension. And that's just going to be the uh, uh, the length of the mean vector, and I will consider that to be good for now. But I do want to uh, I want to write a method that allows us to print a data type, or rather print a piece of data that is an element of this data type. Uh, so we would do so by defining the string function. And um, I actually came up with a pretty, I really like the way I wrote this. So, and it's, you know, it's actually sort of a, it, it's sort of a long function, so I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but um, I'll at least give an example. So why don't we write our main function here? Um, at the bottom. So I'll say uh, def main and x bar is uh, 2, 3 and p equals uh, 2, 1, 2, uh, 1, 4. And I need to put this in to um, uh, you know a nested array, and so if I say that uh, Gauss is the Gaussian, where again Gaussian is our class, um, and we call I don't know if you know in Python we generate the data by calling the constructor, which is the same name as the class, so it's similar to Java. Um, so we'll say Gaussian, uh, or Gauss is Gaussian of x bar p, and let's just print Gauss to see what it looks like. So if I call Python 3 of fp example dot pi, take some time to initialize the RAM, I think. Now that did not do what I expected it to. Oh, yes, because we need to, at the very uh, at the very bottom, say if name equals main, then main. So this is just sort of standard Python practice. So, this, uh, you know, this is pretty cool. So if I, if I print out Gaussian, uh, or if I, if I print out Gauss here, then uh, it will be shown as uh, a uh, an n with the mean here and the covariance here. So uh, that's what this string method uh, does. Now, what we want to do is program in our measurement model. So I have here f equals np dot array. And let's just do one, negative one, uh, and then one, one. So this is sort of a rotation matrix. But there is an issue here. Um, we want to code in our dynamics model as a function, because this is functional programming. And when we represent everything as a function, then uh, we can, you know, do this higher order function stuff uh, that will allow us to generalize to not just matrices but nonlinear functions, um, you know, and other other types of functions as well. Uh, so what I want to do is make a method or a function, and I'm going to call it um, unrepresent. matrix and it's going to take in an f and I'm going to return the function lambda 
x. Uh, so I'm going to return a function that takes in an x and returns f times x. So, like I said, the reason that we want to write our dynamics model in the form of a function, even though this is a really trivial case, uh, is so that we can uh, potentially in the future uh, define other functions such as C infinity functions that have you know their own representation including uh, you know Jacobian and um, you know uh, we can represent other transformations that have different types of structure as their own uh, function and uh, if everything is function then we can program generically uh, using you know uh, uh, taking using higher order functions that take in generic functions and return these generic functions so I called it unrepresent matrix simply because F is the, you know, big F is the matrix representation of uh, the function F. And so uh, I, I want to make an inverse to this, um, and I'm going to call it represent matrix. Now this is, uh, this is one of the more sketchy parts of, of my code here. Uh, so the way that uh, if if we have if we have a generic function and we want to find the matrix representation of it, then the best way I can think of to do that is to uh, take a basis and uh, uh, pass the basis through the function and then build up those mapped bases into a matrix. So I have that here. Uh, so, and also in my code I have nx equals 2. So clearly this is a uh, hard-coded example where we're simply working in R2. Uh, but I say mapped basis, and it's going to be f of ei for ei in list of np. So I built up uh, this, you know, np.identity. That's sort of like the i function, you know, eye in, in MATLAB, uh, with you know, and, and this is a, a 2D uh, identity matrix. Uh, I split the columns into instead of being a matrix, it's a list of vectors. And so for ei in this list of vectors, uh, I am mapping, uh, uh, you know, each basis vector through f, and uh, then I'm representing it as a list. And so I then have to stack up the list. So return np dot vstack mapped basis dot t. And the reason there's this transpose here, and I'm doing a vstack, is because of the way NumPy handles vectors as uh, row uh, arrays instead of column arrays. So that's kind of annoying. So like I said, this is sort of the jankiest part of my code. Uh, in an ideal scenario, and I don't really know how to do this in Haskell, uh, but I would like, um, we could represent transformations in Python as like sort of we have this generic class and it's it's a, a class representing a transformation that has its own uh, uh, its own function as a mapping and it's also sort of annotated with a uh, its its matrix representation uh, and that's sort of what I tried doing in uh, when I was taking dr. Humphreys's final <laughs> and it ended up being becoming extremely complicated uh, and uh, that was sort of part of the reason why I uh, you know, that final ended up not going too well because I wasn't able to finish that code. But, uh, for, so for here, I'm taking a more jank approach um, to representing or finding the matrix representation of a function and also finding the function functional form of a matrix. So from here, it's actually just a simple matter of finding this uh, lifting uh, trans, you know, function that takes in an f and returns a v. So I like to. I'm probably going to write it right under the Gaussian class. So 
uh, I can say def Gaussian lift. Again, it's going to take in an F. And I'm going to say, uh, again, F equals represent matrix F. And we're going to define our uh, mapping phi as a function that takes in a Gaussian and we'll say uh, x hat is just going to be gauss.mean uh, p is gauss.covariance so we have to pull these from uh, the mean and covariance of our data type here and we will return a data value of Gaussian where uh, the mean, the new mean, will be uh, f times x hat and the uh, covariance will be uh, f times x hat, or sorry, f times p times f transpose and instead of, this has to be a, a dot. <laughs> okay, now we're going to return to B. So we have made our Gaussian lifting function. It takes in an F here and it returns a phi. And one thing I should note is that, you know, like I said, it is pretty inefficient. It's unfortunate that we have a uh, when when we define our function here uh, so I, and, and let's do that right now so f is going to be uh, unrepresent matrix f so what we're doing is is we're converting this uh, f matrix into a function and then when we pass it through the Gaussian lift, then it's going to be pulling out the matrix again. So it is sort of unefficient. So it's it's really not ideal. Uh, like I said, it'd be nicer if there were a simple way to annotate the structure of a function uh, beyond just it being a function in Python or Haskell. Now Haskell does have, uh, and this is the big drawback, the drawback that I mentioned, um, that's what happened. Okay, uh, the drawback that I mentioned uh, in Haskell is that uh, Haskell has its type system is uh, modeled as this generic all-encompassing category that is equivalent almost. It's, it's very close to the category set. So the category of sets where uh, morphisms between sets are functions. And in our case, if we're working through, um, if, if we're working in RN, then the category would actually be the category of vector spaces, where the morphisms are linear transformations. So um, there are some libraries that attempt to allow you to put some more structure into your morphisms. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think they're typically modeled as like subcategories, um, so you can you can sort of model a subcategory within set uh, to be sort of the category of uh, linear transformations or other you know differentiable trans transformations or something like that. So that is, uh, in my opinion, could be a fruitful area of exploration. And I actually have a list uh, somewhere around here of the. Uh, set like there are several libraries I think that are attempting to uh, formulate these concepts so uh, I'm hoping that uh, that works out so our video is I think getting a little long at this point I don't know how long it's gonna be but uh, for now what I want to do is map the dynamics model right which is F uh, or I want to lift the dynamics model to a f uh, into phi, and then I want to see if this will uh, actually uh, allow us to propagate our uh, 
uh, uncertainty. So if I said, oh, beautiful, <laughs> my cat just sneezed all over me. So let's see if we can do that. Uh, so I'll just write v is equal to uh, Gaussian lift of f. And so I want to print Gauss, and let's all print, let's also print phi of Gauss. So instead of calling this Gauss, I might just say this is um, uh, past uncertainty, and uh, I'll say uh, present uncertainty equals phi of past uncertainty. So uh, I wish I didn't have to type that twice. Okay. So let's see what these return. Hey, okay. So we have our vector, which looks like it's been rotated and scaled as well, I think. Uh, and we also have mapped our uncertainty. So uh, this is our prior, or rather our past covariance, and uh, we've propagated it to the current state. So I may just stop here. Uh, it's taken a while for me to get to this point where I'm actually uh, recording videos and be programming and stuff. Uh, so I'm, um, you know, this this has been a long time coming, and I bet the video is actually pretty long already. So next time, or in the next video, we will do exactly what we did here, but we will do so for the uh, unscented Kalman filter, or rather the unscented transform. And uh, then beyond that, we will, you know, sort of uh, generalize these lifting functions to being something a little bit greater. And so I'm, I'm super excited about that. So thank you, Dr. Bacolas, for watching this so far. And uh, I hope this is intriguing or interesting to you. I, I hope you can follow everything. And I will see you next time.